Uh, my topic uh, today is airway management, the patient's perspective. And what I've done is to break the talk up into the patient's perspective of airway management before the, the, the operation, during the operation, and after the operation. So, um, so let's talk about the patient's perspective before the operation. I did a literature search on this, uh, seeing what was in the literature about what the patient may be worried about with respect to airway management before coming to the operating room, and there is not a lot out there. Uh, I did come up with a study from 1991, a survey of 800 patients' knowledge, attitudes, and concerns regarding anesthesia. And although a fair number of concerns were raised in a number of different areas, impairment in judgment, anesthesiologist qualifications, nervous of hospital environment, pain medications, airway management as a concern did not show up in that study at all. And in fact, this finding was duplicated in a recent study published from Turkey, 2018. Again, airway management as a concern did not show up at all. Top two concerns in this study were post-operative pain and waking up in the middle of surgery. Reasonable concerns, certainly, but again, airway management, not a concern. So it doesn't seem from the patient's perspective that there's a lot of concern about airway management. Maybe the patients just don't know that they should be concerned about airway management one way or the other or maybe they think we're particularly well-trained to manage airways, which hopefully we are. What about the patient's perspective then during the operation? Two things I'd like to talk about here. Firstly, a weight tracheal intubation, of which of course the patient will have a major perspective. And actually I'm gonna talk as well about airway management after the induction of general anesthesia from the patient's perspective. So let's start off with a few words about a weight tracheal intubation. Um, Couple of studies, three in fact, out there um, at this point, uh, suggesting that uh, the incidence of uh, awake tracheal intubation in patients presenting for general anesthesia requiring an endotracheal tube is actually about 1%, which seems like a high incidence, um, but that study has been duplicated from three different countries now, Canada, the US, and uh, Great Britain, so it seems like it's a pretty valid figure. I don't doubt that this probably relates to tertiary care practice, perhaps with uh, active uh, head and neck surgery services, plastic surgery services, neurosurgery, and uh, maxillofacial. So perhaps that incidence is lower in community practice, but nonetheless, a fair number of patients still undergo a weak tracheal intubation. So obviously those patients are uh, most often quite aware during awake tracheal intubation. So from the patient's perspective, what do we need to consider? Well, we did one of those studies at our institution, in fact, and uh, we looked at the complications that uh, occurred during weight tracheal intubation. And if you look at the top four complications that occurred, um, greater than one attempt, cough or gag, difficult tube passage, change to smaller or alternative tube were the, were the highest four complications. Now, this was a retrospective study, uh, so it was self-reported by the attending anesthesiologist, so take it with a grain of salt, if you will. <clears throat> but uh, let's consider those top four uh, complications. All of them certainly would be experienced by the patient. So let's talk about how we can potentially prevent those from being issues. So specifically with reference to pre uh, preventing cough or gag, I think the most important thing there uh, is excellent topical airway anesthesia. I personally use a three-step approach and I use no formulation of lidocaine less than 3%. So I believe in, in using higher concentrations of lidocaine because I think that that is what it takes to get uh, good conditions for awake tracheal intubation. You know, I make it my, my purpose during an awake intubation to try to get the tube down with minimal cough or gag or even no cough or gag. I, that's what keeps it fun for me and, and pleasant for the patient. So. I find that you need the, the more potent formulations of lidocaine. I use up to six or seven milligrams per kilo, uh, kilogram of uh, lidocaine for the purpose. I also find it helps for the purpose of uh, attenuating cough or gag to use low doses of a narcotic. So very often I will use a low dose remifentanil infusion or well, a small bolus doses of fentanyl or, or sufentanil. And my purpose behind using a narcotic is uh, certainly not sedation. That's not one of my goals during a weight tracheal intubation. I'm using it as a cough medicine. So that if you think back to the last time you had a horrible, dry, hacking cough, you probably went to the pharmacy to get a codeine-containing cough medicine because 
That's probably the only thing that might have some effect at preventing you from coughing or staying awake all night with a horrible dry hacky cough. And I'm using a narcotic during awake intubation in the same fashion. I'm using it to attenuate airway reflexes. And it's very effective in that regard, as is effective topical airway anesthesia. So where it's not contraindicated by the patient with an advanced degree of obstructing airway pathology, I do like to use low, dose, uh, low doses of nar narcotic for their cough medicine uh, attenuation of airway reflexes. Okay, let's move on to um, the other complications that came out of our study. The need for more than one attempt, difficulty with tube passage, or the need to change to a smaller or alternative tube. And these are all uh, complications which would absolutely be experienced by the, by the patient. And uh, I would think they would probably be quite unpleasant to be experienced by the patient. So here I think that attention to detail and the preparation for your awake intubation is all important. So I do mainly adult practice, um, so that leaves me the option of using an adult-sized uh, flexible endoscope, or a flexible bronchoscope for my uh, awake intubations. Uh, and, and over an, uh, an adult bronchoscope, which I am using mainly through the mouth, uh, what, and that leaves me the option to use a large bronchoscope, I ensleeve the smallest endotracheal tube that it will accept, typically a 7 or a 7.5 endotracheal tube. And what that does, that has the effect of uh, minimizing the gap between the outer border of the bronchoscope and the inner border of the endotracheal tube. So you can see in the picture there that uh, although this is an airway exchange catheter used in this particular photographic example, there's quite a gap between the uh, 8.5 endotracheal tube and the outer diameter of the uh, airway exchange catheter. Uh, we can minimize that by ensleeving a smaller endotracheal tube. So no matter what the operation, I always use a small endotracheal tube over an adult bronchoscope to minimize that gap, and that will help avoid the hang-up of the tube on the larynx uh, during awake tracheal intubation. In addition to that, I like to use a bullet tubed or a bullet-tipped tube, uh, such as a Parker tube or the Fast Track LMA tube will also uh, fulfill the same role. Uh, because as you can see, the tip of the tube curves over to hug the bronchoscope or to hug an airway exchange catheter. And that also, I find in my experience, helps with smooth passage of the tube through the larynx and uh, will help to prevent hang up of the tube on the larynx. So attention to detail like that with the preparation for awake tracheal intubation uh, should help with the patient's perspective on awake intubation by preventing the need for more than one attempt or, or stopping and changing to a smaller tube. It's quite instructive to, uh, to look at this study. This study reports on an airway course where anesthetists intubated each other awake. Um, so although the, uh, the study is now somewhat old, uh, it, uh, it reported on uh, 200 airway course participants over a number of years uh, who did 1,300 endoscopies. Um, so obviously each participant was intubated multiple times. 97% were intubated nasally in this uh, particular course. Medications that they used included glycopyrrolate, uh, an intranasal vasoconstrictor, and nebulized and sprays you go lidocaine up to 9 milligrams per kilogram which seems like a high dose, but that is the maximum dose published by the British Thoracic Society uh, for bronchoscopy. So it's, it's within standard of care to use that high a dose of lidocaine for the purpose of awake intubation as well. And no sedative medications were used, which, which I always think is instructive. It's good to know that you can get a tube down during awake intubation without the crutch, if you will, of systemic medications. Small dose of narcotic apart. Now, as part of the study, uh, they reported on a survey done of the course participants after the, uh, the, uh, the course was completed. A uh, five-point scale asked about discomfort. Middle of the road, most participants said that uh, the procedure was slightly painful. So this, of course, would probably parallel what the patient would experience. Asked about anxiety, most course participants said it was slightly worrying, not surprisingly. Asked about coughing or gagging. Most participants said it was slightly uncomfortable, so perhaps you know there could be room for improvement there. Asked about other sensations, again, most said it was slightly uncomfortable. And asked about the overall experience of awake tracheal intubation on themselves. Uh, the, the majority said it was acceptable, uh, four said it was distressing, 25 said it was enjoyable, and four said it was very enjoyable. So we should probably worry about those people just a little bit. 
They reported in the uh, same study on immediate complications. Um, so again, in the 200 course participants, nasal bleeding was the highest reported complication. Not surprisingly, because 97 of these awake intubations occurred through the nose. And I have to say that <clears throat> unless there's a good reason why I need to do my awake intubation nasally, I tend to do them orally just to avoid that exact complication. I think it's probably more comfortable in a well topically anesthetized patient to do awake intubation through the mouth. Once you get uh, used to driving the bronchoscope, I contend that it really is no more technically difficult to go through the mouth than the nose, and you certainly will avoid that complication of nasal bleeding. Um, the nodal rhythm may, may well be a vagal side effect of going through the nose as well. Neurologic symptoms were reported, uh, lightheadedness, drowsiness, dysphoria, dizziness, etc. Um, my only comment about this table is that I worry or I wonder um, if a number of those side effects may have related to hyperventilation on the, poor, on, on the part of the patient. So I think very often we as clinicians will encourage our patients to take a slow, deep breath in during, during uh, application of topical airway anesthesia so that the local anesthetic gets carried down to the larynx and gets carried down to the trachea, but you, you shouldn't overdo it. Um, I think all of us in the audience, probably right now, if you took three or four tidal volume breaths, you could probably start to feel a little lightheadedness. So I worry that some of those side effects may have been related to over-enthusiastic um, requests of the clinician to take big breaths on the part of the, uh, of the patient. So um, when I'm asking the patient to take a big breath in to carry a local anesthetic to the trachea or the larynx, I always say, you know, no more than two or three big breaths at a time, just to avoid that potential side effect. Now, it has to be said that um, for my awake tracheal intubations, I do prefer to use a flexible endoscope, a flexible bronchoscope. Uh, yes, a video laryngoscope can be used for the purpose. Yes, a direct laryngoscope can be used for the purpose. Uh, a lot of studies being published these days on the use of video laryngoscopy for awake tracheal intubation. And I think it's a, it's a reasonable option for the patient with moderate predictors of difficulty. But it, uh, the fact of the matter is, that for the very, very difficult or very challenging anatomy patient, you know, the patient with no mouth opening or fixed flexion deformity or great big tongue piling out of the mouth from angioedema or Ludwig's angina, you will need to use the flexible bronchoscope very often to go through the nose in order to, uh, to successfully intubate the patient. So that my argument is that if you need the flexible bronchoscope for the most difficult of cases, perhaps you should be using it for the less difficult but still difficult cases that you're doing uh, awake intubation on. So of course, irony of ironies, my friend George Kovacs in Halifax is a, an emergency physician and a wonderful uh, airway educator, called me up one day at the end of my neuro list and said, Adam, please come down to the emergency department. I'd like you to intubate me awake using a video laryngoscope uh, for uh, teaching video purposes. So down I trotted. Um, now George did not want an IV started, so of course I started an IV on George for safety reasons, but I did not give him any, any sedative medication. I did carry with me a bag of intralipid in case of uh, untoward effects from high doses of local anesthetic, um, but those are the only systemic medications I, I had prepared for him. So with IV access then, I topically anesthetized George's airway, and the video that you'll see is me uh, doing an awake intubation using a video laryngoscope. I think that as you're doing both the topicalization and the video laryngoscopy part of an awake intubation, from the pers uh, patient's perspective, <clears throat> what makes it way more acceptable is to have a calm and almost continuous, uh, continuous conversation from, from you, the clinician. I think that goes a long way to allaying anxiety or preventing anxiety probably as much so as, uh, as anxiolytic medications. So important to have the confidence in your ability to successfully intubate the patient with minimal discomfort to the patient uh, and to tell the patient the steps that you're doing as you're going along. So uh, even to George, who's uh, an, an airway clinician, I, I kept up a, a fairly continuous uh, pattern of conversation. Here I am passing the tube, having performed video laryngoscopy. This is with a glide scope. You can see the assistant uh, leaving just as I'm passing the tube. I'm, I'm hoping that doesn't happen in your country. Um, down goes the tube. Uh, 
uh, out goes the stylet. So, you know, the tube is down, uh, George, as, uh, as a willing uh, victim here to my awake intubation technique. No cough, no gag. Um, I tend not to inflate the cuff of the endotracheal tube until after I've given a dose of sedative hypnotic when I'm doing a, an awake intubation in the airway. That way the patient can breathe both around the tube and through the tube. Uh, and I do find that you still get entitled CO2 confirmation that the tube is in the right place, even with that cuff not yet inflated. And the nice thing about having a well topically anesthetized airway is that I can take my time in giving that induction dose of sedative hypnotic. It doesn't happen, as a, it doesn't have to happen as a big emergency. Uh, here's George taking a selfie of himself. Um, so tolerating the tube very, very comfortably. <clears throat> and that's a tribute to, to a good topical airway uh, anesthesia technique. Uh, that gives me the time in, the, in, in a neuro patient, for example, to, uh, to test the patient, make sure they're still neurologically intact after the intubation as well. I made the mistake of sending that picture to my wife. This is what she texted back. And you have to admit that she's probably quite correct. So um, in summary of uh, uh, this part of the talk then, anxiety prevention in order to make the patient's perspective of awake intubation as pleasant as possible. I do think that it's important to intubate patients in the semi-sitting or sitting position. Anytime you mess with the patient's airway, they're, they'll always far be, be far more comfortable in the uh, sitting position. We talked about the importance of effective topical airway anesthesia. I do use higher doses of local anesthetic. Uh, we talked about the help that uh, small doses of narcotic can make uh, as a cough medicine or anti tussive or anti-airway reflex medication. I do use small doses of anxiolytic if it's not contraindicated by a highly obstructed airway, so small doses of midazolam. But the important point is a big dose of your professionally calm uh, um, and uh, reassuring uh, voice during the procedure. Um, thanks for listening and I thank you for your attention.